Okay, Ajit, I think um, the floor is yours. Okay, so welcome, welcome to everyone. Um, this is one uh, uh, session and the panel that we are looking forward to. We have people from, uh, we have seasoned facilitators from all over the globe. Uh, we have Bob who is joining us from US. Uh, Bob, can you wave your hand so people can see you? That's hello, Bob. hello. I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a cell phone, uh, we have, but I'm not driving. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Bob. Welcome. Uh, we have Gary from UK. Gary, can you just kind of wave your hand and oh, great. So, Gary, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, so uh, this is Rhonda. We have Rhonda from Australia. Hello. Yeah, that's Rhonda. And uh, we have Hector from Mexico. Hector, you are not showing your hands. Okay, so that's Hector. Uh, Charlotte will be supporting and co-moderator with me. Charlotte, can you also say hi to the participants? Yeah. Hello, everybody. This is okay. Charlotte from Copenhagen, Denmark. Hey, Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. So, Love your city. Yes. <laughs> So, so welcome to the panelists and um, before we start a quick uh, uh, information to people who have joined in. Uh, so your, your videos are not on, you will not be able to see yourself, but will be able to see the panelists. Uh, what you need to remember is that if you have a question or a question to ask the panelists, if you go to the chat window just below your screen, you could ask uh, questions and uh, uh, we have uh, support uh, to bring that up and then we'll take the, take up the questions with, with that specific uh, panelist. Uh, so there could be two kind of questions that may come up. One is a general question and the second is a specific question that may come up to a specific panelist. So the way we are going to start is by asking um, our panelists to uh, look at the theme, the, the topic being the future of facilitation and um, having the rich experience that each one of you has. So what is what is the future of facilitation look, look like to each one of you? So I'll start with, um, say, Bob first. Robert? Uh, well, I, I think the future of facilitation uh, is, is very strong. Um, I think that... Uh, um, even though we seem to have uh, expanded facilitation uh, awareness uh, and in some places maybe even saturated the market, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, beyond that, uh, we're looking at, at uh, the need increasing much more rapidly than we can meet it. Uh, and particularly when you recognize uh, the, all the different uh, media possible uh, uh, possibilities that we have now for for do it, for for facilitating other than just face to face. Okay, I'll pass. Sure, um, Rhonda, what's what's your take on the um, the primary topic that we're talking about? I think the future is bright. Um, what, what concerns me is that um, two possibilities, and that is a splintering into so many different um, sub-specialties that people don't recognise it as a sort of a, a core thing that we're, what we're all doing is similar. I think that is a danger that we need to be careful of and hang on to, make sure that we hang on to the core um, ethics, uh, competencies, uh, role that we understand a facilitator to be while it's splintering into these uh, different areas. So my concern is as we're growing, we need to be careful that we don't dilute uh, what facilitation really is and that we don't do that at the expense of ending up with facilitation light, L-I-T-E. Um, so uh, that I think it, we're growing, but we need to be mindful that we hang on to what 
the core role of a facilitator is while it is becoming more diverse. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, can I move it forward to Gary? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I uh, ditto all of the above. So I agree with Bob and I agree with Rhonda that the future is very strong. Uh, I, I particularly like Bob, your words around increasing, you know, the need is increasing much more rapidly maybe than we can, than we have the capacity to deliver. Uh, and Rhonda, yeah, future's bright. Uh, I take on board, I think, Rhonda's points about uh, splintering. I think that's an interesting um, thing that we could maybe push a bit more. Well, and I think one of the things that we're seeing, certainly here in the UK, is um, the recognition, and, and in fact, only yesterday I was, I was, running a session at a conference and only yesterday people are also beginning to see that a there is such a thing as a profession for facilitation and that actually you know you you can do that as a role but also I guess um, and it probably builds on one of the other questions a little later that organizations and individuals uh, are certainly seeing that facilitation as a core competence uh, in other roles. So, uh, for example, yesterday I was at the conference with, for the Association of Business Psychologists and they definitely see facilitation as a core competence for business psychology. So I, I think um, along with all of the tech and the way that the tech is advancing really quickly and, make, and becoming much more smooth to use, I do see that facilitation future is strong. I do see facilitation becoming more and more a core competence for other roles okay and and if uh, we can so and if we can I'd, at some point i'd like to come back to Rhonda's point about splintering i think that's an interesting conversation we could have about the future in particular in in respect of some of the stuff that iaf is doing around the certified professional facilitator and pro path um work yeah uh, so th thank, thank you for that um uh, my mistake, um, just to let the group know that uh, Charlotte is part of the panelist. Uh, Charlotte, uh, would you like to kind of uh, give your insights on how do you see the future of facilitation? You're muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself, Charlotte. Sorry, can you yeah. hear me all now? Uh, yeah. thank you. Now we can hear you. Good. Thank you for this. Um, and thank you for the invitation to join in here. Uh, very interesting aspects that my co-panelists uh, raise. I agree strongly that the future facilitation is very strong. And I think it's actually stronger than any, any of us really understand right now. Uh, I work from a political aspect um, within the political system. And there was an interesting Swedish article in, I think it was the New York Times a couple of months ago, that, that address the fact that right now, a lot of political parties all over the world, they have hired spin doctors, but the future might show hired facilitators working with a different uh, ethics, code of ethics within the political system, which I found and find to be a very interesting thought. Um, but I also think that we need to as Rhonda says, hang on to our core ethics and insist on the fact that facilitation is not moderation. Because otherwise, I think we will diffuse, uh, we, will, uh, we will, people around us will continue to be a little bit confused about what it is that we actually do when we facilitate. But we need to continue building the understanding of people around us that facilitation is a professional practice in its own right. That's it for me now. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Sherlet. Thanks for those wonderful words. Um, over to you, Hector. Um, how does facilitation look for you in the future? Uh, well, it, it's interesting because uh, um, also I agree with everybody. Um, there's there's a, a question. It's a kind of like a, like like leadership in a way. I, I see. Uh, everybody knows about leadership. We've had 20 or 30 years of uh, strong leadership training all around the world with leadership gurus here and there. And but there's no a leadership university. Also, there are a lot of leadership institutes all across the world. 
So uh, sometimes I wonder if, if facilitation, it, it, it's gonna go th like that. It's gonna be accepted as a, as a, as a core uh, uh, competence, but, but, but diffused uh, professionally. So everybody has it, everybody has to do it, everybody has to be an expert on leadership but uh, it's, it's not recognized because we it could get diluted in, in, in that way as well as a profession. So I do think that as a skill and I, it's gonna, it's exploding and it has to uh, in order to, to, to enhance the way we work as, as a community, as a society, but uh, as a competence and as a profession, uh, uh, there's gonna be a, 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 it's an interesting discussion because uh, if everybody's you doing it, does it is it is it a profession? And so mm -hmm. so so just taking just sharing my my, my 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 thoughts with the rest of the of the team here. Sure, thank you, thank you for um, bringing that context in that it's like leadership. Everyone knows it, and still um, people kind of uh, use it, but still there's a there's a quest to know it better, and in the process we may be diluting. Um, what what really facilitators can do. Uh, but what I would like to do is uh, pick up Rhonda's thought here about um, a code, you know, sticking up to the code. Future is bright, uh, we need to stick to the code. Uh, let's, let's deep dive into this element first. So when we look at future, um, how do we ensure that the code is maintained? How do we ensure ethics, um, competencies are being looked at and people are admiring. Rhonda, you would like to go first? Uh, it, it, my answer in short, Ajit, is I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a, it's a huge thing that we're, we're grappling with. As facilitation finds its way into um, is a rapid growth that we're seeing of facilitation. I'm personally seeing with my contacts in India and, and in China, um, mm -hmm. a, a rapid growth um, in some parts of the world. But that growth is often coming from an area of specialty, like um, visual facilitation or agile or, or one area of specialty. And people think, that because they do that, they're a, they're a facilitator. And mm. when I'm, I'm working with them, they really don't understand uh, many of the, it's, it's not just in, in, in China, it's all around the world. Uh, even, you know, in here, people will come on my, um, training with me or they'll attend a workshop. They think they're a facilitator, but the core competencies around um, neutrality, around participation, the ethical lines, um, they are not understanding that or even think it's important. And therefore, they're out there in the market functioning um, mm -hmm. and paying their facilitators. But what's, what's happening is that's a misunderstanding going to their clients who then come to us um, in the IF mm -hmm. expecting us to, to breach those ethics, for example. Yeah. So I really don't know the answer to it. I've been grappling with it for the last 15 years. I really don't know. Um, I'm interested in others' views, yeah. Sure, I, 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 will, I will try to uh, pick on Gary's uh, base, here, like uh, the point of splintering that you brought. Uh, Gary, what are your thoughts? How would you add into what Amanda has just said? Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm having had several conversations recently and also been part of the pro and co-leading co on the ProPath project. Um, I, I do think, and actually I'd like to go back to link it to what Hector said is, you know, does it become something like leadership where, you know, there are people that, would, that are out there that are doing leadership training that that you know or, or doing things under that badge of leadership in the same way that there are people like Rhonda talks about doing stuff under the badge of facilitation and I had an interesting conversation with a with a fellow um, facilitator here in the UK who does um, Lego serious play and you know you can train to be a Lego serious play facilitator okay which enables you to use and, and operate and do the stuff under Lego serious play 
But we was having a conversation around, you know, why would the IAF not recognize that as a as a trained and professional facilitator and and where we actually landed was that actually if the IAF for example were to go down that route to avoid some of that splintering before you can be recognized as an IAF certified serious Lego serious play facilitator which actually really rolls off the tongue doesn't it um, you would have to be CPF first okay so the distinguisher then becomes actually I've done CPF I've, I've I've adhered to the code and the competencies. Oh, and now I'm I'm also a, a Lego series player. I think it's one of those things, like like Rhonda said, we've been grappling for, with for years. You know, there are people that will call themselves facilitators, irregardless, and the word does get used used quite a lot. And um, I, I'm not, and I think one of the things we can do, certainly as as professional facilitators is just try and make people more aware that actually there is a set of globally recognized core competencies there is and will be very shortly a, a recognized professional path and one of the other things we're exploring and i'm i'm, not, I'm hopefully not giving away too much over the over facebook and whatever media we're on is we look we're potentially looking at um, a couple of us that were on the pro path project are also looking at digital badging which is something that's quite that's quite uh, relevant and quite popular, particularly in the learning and, and development communities, around maybe doing you know having your CPF, making sure you've got your CPF. <coughs> excuse me. And then you might have a digital badge that says, "Also, I do serious Lego serious play," or actually, I also do top uh, strategic planning. Or, and and so I think there's a number of ways we be, we can begin to even pro professionalize the profession e even more. But for example, yesterday we, I shared with the group that I, I had close to 30 um, business psychology students in a session yesterday where I shared the core competencies with them. We, we had it up on the wall. We talked through them both from a, from a facilitation you know, in a group context, but also in, as a, from a facilitative leadership context. And the students were great because they were making the connection that actually those com core competencies at its highest level, the six core competencies without even the sub bullets, they can recognize how that can be a, a core competence for facilitation in a group, facilitative leadership, but also core competence full stop. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, I, I'd seen uh, Bob's hand first and I've seen Charlotte wanted to say something. Bob, you want to uh, pitch in? You're on mute. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that, you know, we keep talking about uh, comparing facilitation going the way of leadership. And, and I think there's another example that, or that, that's even more relevant, and that's the term collaboration. Uh, you know, and, and it gets to the, the whole issue around um, uh, our experience is that, that uh, collaboration is, assumed, is an assumed skill. Uh, by most managers, they think that 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 collaboration uh, on their teams is something that comes in their mother's milk, and I don't think anything could be further from the truth. Uh, and I think that that's a manager problem, not a team participant problem. And uh, Rhonda's, uh, you know, concern about you know, uh, you know, how do we how do we get how how what do what do you do about this? I think we start with managers. I think I think that the that that the the, the effort that we need to be uh, putting is is in educating managers uh, to uh, be better uh, at supporting collaboration and 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 uh, as a result uh, using facilitation better. Uh, uh, you know we we. We have a client where we've trained some, I don't know, 2,000 people over the last six or seven years. And every class we teach, we ask the question, uh, or, or we don't even ask the question, what we get is from, from, from the participants, our managers really need this. They need to understand what we are expected to do as facilitators. And until we as a profession begin to address that, I don't think we're gonna, you know, I, I think we're gonna continue to struggle 
in terms of making uh, any great headway in terms of, of, of uh, expanding the effectiveness of facilitation. Sure. Uh, Charlotte, uh, you had put up your hand. Uh... Yes, uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, good. Yep. So I'd like to start with the ethical uh, debate that was raised by Rhonda in the beginning, uh, because it's very dear to me. I think, mm -hmm. first of all, we need to distinguish uh, between facilitating in a formal leadership position or facilitating in an informal leadership position. And I think there's a, it, because it is a leadership discipline, but I think we are looking at a future where more and more people will facilitate informally, but in very close cooperation with a, with a formal leader. Um, and and the, the question raised uh, to, by you, Rhonda, was also how do you make sure that the code of ethics is intact? And I think that that's absolutely crucial to our profession. Um, from my experience, I, I think there's an aspect of this that points inwards towards IAF as a community, and there's an aspect that points outwards. Let me start with the latter. Every single professional facilitator should be, uh, uh, be, um, be willing to accept feedbacks from his participants meaning also not just accept it, but actually ask for it. Ask for feedback, not expect it to be given. Uh, that is what we teach uh, our new facilitators in the alternative, the political party in Denmark, where we train facilitators, that they should proactively ask for feedback from the participants, because that is the best way for them to learn from people who have seen them do what they do. Um, so so it's, a, it's a, better, a matter of making learning, a, a teaching people a mindset to be humble with people that, uh, humble approaching people that you work with instead of arrogant. This one thing I grow really, have grown really, really fed up with it. It's arrogant facilitators that think they are top of the pops because they facilitated a conference for 120 people. And no matter what you say as a participant offering feedback, it's just a no-go. Uh, but I, and I think, you know, that's the outward uh, aspect of it. The inward aspect of this is that we, I've participated in setting up an IAF conference in Copenhagen, and I've been to several European conferences. Um, and there's always this debate on how do we make sure that the workshops and our conferences are facilitated and not taught? Hmm. That is an extremely important strive to hold on to that. But we need to do better than that. We need also to try and start working on providing systematic feedback to presenters. Because very often I go to workshops and, you know, people only comment on the workshops that they, that they go to if it's good. Yeah. But to me, when I do a workshop, what I really learn from is when people uh, tell me something that I can improve. So I need, I think there's a mindset in our community that we need to switch also. And I think it's an expression of, uh, our code of ethics. That's where we do the code of ethics. That's where we stop talking about it and we start doing it. And we need it in order to, well, in Denmark at least, uh, improve the reputation of the profession because a lot of people are like, oh, you're a facilitator? Oh, no, go away. Because they, they, a lot of people have bad experiences with facilitators that didn't really listen to the participants. And I think that's a problem. I have okay, a name right. for that. I have a name for that. Yeah, you, not, you become a facile dictator. Uh -huh. uh, you, 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 because you, you try to just go in and grab the power because, I mean, being a facilitator in front of the group, you have a, an amount of power that's been given you to, from, uh, from the group. 
and yes, it's difficult to let go of that power and actually share it. And uh, also that is the basis of our profession in many ways. Yeah. So before, before I go forward, uh, there are three to four questions we have received. Uh, but let me also talk about uh, some chat uh, that we're receiving. So there's Thorsten, uh, who has talked to all, who has been typing, saying that uh, he agrees with Robert, Bob. I make day by day the same experience in our, corp in our big corporation. Um, I understand it's his corporate he's talking about. If we, as the manager, doesn't start, we expect we can't expect changes in the organization. So uh, that's, that's something which um, he's agreeing to what Bob said. Uh, then um, that's Gary who has replied, but I think um, Sharon agrees with uh, Gary on um, that we need to catch people young. Uh, one of the things that's coming in the question box as well as uh, uh, something that really I would like to take on is uh, when we look at future of facilitation, how much is AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, deep learning, etc., going to make an impact in the world? Uh, can we, as facilitators, take advantage of this being, um, you know, to can we take advantage of all these things to enable the objective of our facilitation? So, who would like to take this from the panelist? Yeah, please go ahead, Gary. Yeah, I'm happy to start this one off because um, I, I gave that one some thought in terms of um, technology and where is the future of facilitation going. And um, I, I don't know about uh, the others on the panel or, and the others that have joined us in the, on the webinar is that there is a lot of technology uh, already. Uh, some of it still a bit clunky, some of it uh, a lot smoother and a lot slicker. And I think as, as things like AR, AI, VR, and uh, video, uh, virtual reality and, and augmented reality become, pardon the pun, become more of a reality, um, I, think, I think people are already beginning to take advantage of that stuff. So I, rem I was reminded of um, some, some, uh, a guy here in the UK called Eddie Obeng, who's already doing some similar work uh, using a product called Cube, which is Cube spelt with a Q. Uh, and if you look, if you want to look that up, it's cube.cc uh, cube uh, on, on the web. And, and that's where you, and I guess it might not be dissimilar to the stuff, uh, Bob, that you were talking about earlier when, before we started with your avatar thing, is, you know, where you can see avatars or people in a room in a virtual space. So that, that's already happening. Some of, the, some of the other tools that people are already using. So we have Meeting Sphere in the UK. You know, you've got, you, somebody mentioned Trello on the, on the chat. You've got Storms, you've got Me Too, you've got Idita, you've got NoodlePod. There, there are so many of, of these products that I think, you know, we are going to be, have to become more familiar with, with using. In particular, as, you know, work in general, whether you're in the private sector, public sector, becomes more complex with more stakeholders and with more multicultural um, groups and individuals represented, I think we've got to be get used to the fact that technology, that I, I run more meetings now where you've got, you know, say, you know, you, just picking numbers, 12 people in the room and six out of the room. And, oh. and we're all doing that, right? And, and we're doing it in different ways. And, and I think the tech, we've got to keep a, a line to the technology. And Bob, I'm sure you have something you want to add on that. Yeah, yeah I think... I think we're we're uh, we're all doing it, and for the most part, we're all doing it not very well. Uh, I, and and that's as much a function of of uh, the technology uh, being inappropriate for the task. Uh, one of the things that that we really try to to uh, make sure we do is where possible fit the technology that 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 uh, mo is most appropriate for the work that has to be done and if you think about it uh, how many clients do you go into where that's really an option they have already decided on a technology and for the most part they've got webex or they've got adobe connect or they've got uh, uh, uh like this you know uh and and as facilitators, uh, for the most part, we're stuck with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we are lucky enough to be able to go in and say, what about, uh, 
a combination of, and they go, oh, we never even thought about that. You know, we, you know, uh, we use, uh, and, I, and, and I guess the other thing to say is there is no silver bullet. Uh, uh, I think that, I think that as facilitators, we don't have to worry a whole lot about being over overtaken by augmented reality or virtual reality or AI. Uh, if you think about how hard it has been for our customers, whether they're government or private sector, whatever, to adopt and do well using the technologies that are out there, uh, there's a million miles between where we are now and uh, serious use of AR or VR or, 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 or those technologies, uh, which is why I'm sort of partial to the 3D immersive because, it, you know, I, I compare using the 3D immersive with avatars to the way Thomas Edison sold electricity to electrify houses. He went into the, to the house to the homeowner and said, no problem, we can pull the electric wires through your gas pipes. We can take your gas lighting fixtures and convert them to electric fixtures so you can screw a light bulb in. And the, uh, the 3D immersive is like that. We're already there. We're already using uh, internet uh, technologies, internet-based technologies, online technologies, but the beauty of 3D Immersive is that it lets us do face-to-face -face things. It lets us do the same kinds of things we do face-to-face -face immerse in a, in a 3D Immersive environment, in, a, in an online environment. Um, Hector, you had shown your hand. Um, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Um, if, if you're a facilitator that uh, thinking that just learning one tool will, will make it... Uh, happen, uh, that's not going to happen. You're going to have to be able to, to manage different tools. And, and it's not only teleconference tools like, like, uh, like Zoom, the one we're using right now. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to have to use different uh, uh, brainstorming tools or different, uh, like the, um, the 3D environment that, Robert, that Bob was sharing. I mean, and it's not because th that's the way that people are going to uh, uh, um, actually hire you. Because you're going to expect a certain kind of interaction, a certain type of work. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, they will ask you to do big, big, big books or small groups and you'll have to adapt. Uh, I mean, if you, if, you're a, if you only use one method, as a, as a, if you're a Lego series play practitioner, and I am, by the way. Um, so uh, if, if you try to apply that tool to every engagement you have, it's not going to work. So you'll have to actually multiply in a way your, your, your approaches depending on which one you work with. Uh, it, it might be that some, some uh, industries uh, will, will prefer a certain kind of approach so you will be able to use that more often than not or in a certain environment, a certain way of working would, would be much more uh, feasible to, to the limitations or the, of the engagement. But still, if, if you only know one method to work with, uh, you might be limiting yourself and uh, uh, the impact that you're actually doing. So, so yeah. So what I'm, yeah, before I, I, I come to Rhonda, uh, what I'm hearing also is uh, in the panel that A is, is a blended approach that will have to be merged. So we'll have to have, a, uh, we'll have to be in a room as well as we'll have to connect to people um, uh, from AI platform with others. What Hector is bringing about is we need to be also aware of the different uh, uh, platforms that are there. And that's how we need to kind of uh, be uh, better in using these different platforms to our facilitation work. Rhonda? Yeah, I think what we need to be very careful of with the um, rapidly changing world of uh, technology with facilitation is that the tail, that the, the tail will wag the dog. And mm -hmm. Um, but by this, what I mean is, uh, just like Bob said, you know, this is the technology we've got, would you please use it? Um, now, we are probably all working with hybrid approaches. So I do a lot of pre-work online, but nothing um, replaces in some situations face 
to face, even though I've written blogs on how deep you can go on a Zoom thing with up close and personal, when you're working in the, and it relates to a chat thing coming up from Tom Schwartz actually, when you're working with the deep emotional elements of something that's happening with a team, there is something that is irreplaceable when a client wants you to go for that, that deep connectedness and they want you to do it with a, a team of 50 all connecting in from around the world with um, unstable technologies and expecting to get the level of change. And Bob, we talk about immersive technologies, but here in a developed country like Australia, we have areas that half the country doesn't have broadband. I have friends that are in country villages and one where we're, I'm planning to move where there's no broadband. So um, it, it doesn't work a lot of the time and, and many of the places where I do work internationally, backwards and forwards, I get better internet in Bangalore and parts of China than I do um, an hour out of Melbourne. So I think we need to be very careful when one client sitting there in London or Shanghai says let's do this virtually and they're expecting something that technology is just not there yet and if we are working uh, Tom mentions technology on steroids and I think we need to be very careful that that doesn't drive what we do and we don't fall for a client wanting to save money or wanting to save the world um, and fix everything through what is available technologically, but mightn't be the best way to go. And how do we handle that with our clients and um, sell the idea that we need a hybrid approach and sometimes we need smaller groups face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, I, I, I do so much work virtually, but it's not perfect. Yeah, I, I agree. Got, Rana, I, got uh, excited. I got excited about that. <laughs> Sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, Bob, I, I know you want to say something, but something about Rhonda, she does so many webinars that we have been part of. Um, I, I kind of see her as an authority now on Zoom and webinars. Um, but uh, before I come to Bob, there's, there's a very interesting question and maybe Bob can also sh show some light here. Uh, Tom has uh, asked this question, a challenge for modern times perhaps is the contradictions between do it fast, get it right, and facilitation as a reflective art involving affective as well as cognitive, especially in Asian countries. Please comment. Anyone? You can't hear me? Yeah, yes. Charlotte, do you want to? Yes, I can hear you. And, and just um, a small uh, meta instruction. When I do this, it's instead of clapping. So oh, it works okay. pretty well, jazz hands on, on online conferences to show your agreement or your, uh, uh, your enjoyment with what's going on. So that's why I do this all the time, because I like it. Well, I, I, I raised my hand because uh, to me, that is one of the biggest challenges uh, in the political or facilitating in a political session is actually creating the space around uh, you know, the sessions that you facilitate to actually prepare them uh, enough for you to actually be able to make a difference. That is the challenge number one. And in my experience, the, the, the less people know about facilitation as a professional practice, the less they tend to prioritize to prepare what is it is that it actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, we, we in the party, the political party, the alternative in Denmark, we have this uh, cultural change that has been going on for the last three, four years, where in the beginning, people thought, well, I'm a facilitator. I don't have to be there uh, any sooner than the participants, do I? And I was just, literally, I saw people coming in uh, through the door at the same time as the participants. And I was like, Okay, it, your understanding of facilitation does not match mine. Can we have that conversation on that? And, and we, we have grown from to now over the last four years to be a, a community of 30 people now that understand this, understands this challenge. But the thing is, as late as yesterday, 
on Messenger, uh, this very nice lady reached out to me on Messenger and said, do you know a facilitator in the southern, jet, uh, j southern part of Jutland? Because we need to do a workshop on Saturday. Uh, do you know anybody who's free at that time? And I'm like, well, I quickly, I wrote her a few names. I always said to her, reach out to them today. They need to prepare. <laughs> and so it's one thing is for the facilitators to understand that what they do needs preparation. Another thing is to, to teach our clients that what we do requires preparation. And it's a long haul. It's a long, um, really difficult hole, but it's starting to work for us, you know, bit by bit. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's, that's, that's an interesting insight. Um, I have an interesting question here, which comes from Tom, and I'm just putting it up uh, in, a, in a concise way. Um, somewhere in the chat box, uh, Tom's thought is, would AI be the facilitator? And my understanding here is, uh, would we actually stand up uh, facilitators or we facilitators in the room become redundant and would artificial intelligence itself be the facilitator? So what are, what are your thoughts? Um, anyone? When, when I, I think it, it, yep. when it happens, uh, that's, good, that's the, the singularity event. Uh, when a computer can facilitate on its own, uh, uh, yeah, we're done. <laughs> I would say that. I mean, it's not going to happen. I, I don't think that's anything we have to worry about in the in the foreseeable future. Quite frankly, I'm I'm uh, yeah, I agree. When if, if that happens, I, I'll I'll turn in my CPF. <laughs> <laughs> However, there's there's uh, there's an interesting uh, um, there's a company in in in. Um, in Europe, uh, collaboration.ai, that what they do is they use some algorithms to, to group people together uh, in the work that they do. So uh, normally we, we put together subgroups in a discussion uh, using, I mean, simple, you know, like a, who's interested in that topic, you go into that group and, and get to work uh, or something like that, very kind of superficial in a way sometimes. And they do, they use these algorithms to, okay, whom do should we group pe uh, people with? So the so the result of the subgroup would be more effective than just a random uh, putting together uh, uh, within it. So so and that's an interesting approach. I mean I mean instead of just okay do one two three four get together to discuss instead of okay who has a deep uh, interest in a certain issue and a certain topic and who has the background that can actually support it. And sometimes you as a facilitator don't have all that information because you have to do a lot of processing in order to be very effective with that. So they're using software to help in that process, kind of like a matchmaking service, you know, like match.com, but for yeah. subgroups in an engagement. So yeah, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting idea because normally you don't, sometimes you don't think too much about that. Yeah. Bob, you wanted to share. So yeah, Bob. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm also an assessor, a CPF assessor, and please don't ask me to assess a computer. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving, I'm, yeah. I just, by the way, I'm loving seeing Bob's big finger come really close to the camera every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> you need, you, okay, need, so, uh, you need a stick or something, Bob. <laughs> I think, can I, I, I mean, I just, maybe if, it, if it's okay I just, to shift away for a bit, I was just thinking, I wanted to go back to the very original question about, you know, what the future of facilitation and, and, and I, I do want to pull it back to, I think the future of facilitation is bright. And I do think that it, the future of facilitation is very strong. And, and we're really fortunate here at the moment in the UK, in the United Kingdom, we've got lots of peer, networks popping up so that's a lot of it's being driven by the IAF England and Wales with meetups we have meetups in four different regions in the country but we have um, you know support networks popping up 
So we have something called Facilitation Shindig, which is a gathering which meets in three different places across the country. We have something called the School of Facilitation. We have something that is quite new that some others may have seen called Liberating Structures, which is based on the Liberating Structures book. Uh, all of these little peer networks popping up, which are encouraging people, both facilitators and their friends, to, to come to share, to experiment, to play, to deep dive into uh, particular processes and, and really just spreading the word of, of facilitation. And, and, and that's working really well here in the UK, and I'm sure it is in other places. Um, so in terms of the future being bright and being strong, I, I de we definitely see that here. The peer support here in the UK is phenomenal, especially with some of these people that are, that are putting on some of these things like the facilitation shindig, the School of Facilitation, Liberating Structures. And they're doing it for the profession. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that, Gary. Um, there's there's a, a question that builds on uh, what we are speaking now, and I think Sunil has put it up way up front uh, at the start of the panel discussion. Uh, the question is um, how. Uh, so what are the urgent actions to future proof our practice? So here we have we are talking about AI taking over as a facilitator and. Uh, Gary, Gary's statement just before we came to this question was uh, the future is bright. So if we look at future is bright, then how can we, uh, what are the urgent actions that we as facilitators need to do now to future proof our practice? Anyone? Yep, Rhonda. Um, the pro path, I think, is um, one excellent way, one excellent way uh, to do that. Uh, what I what I think, it, I'm speaking from my part of the world where we are splintered. There are two sort of kind of separate um, entities playing in, in the field here. And in other parts of the world where there are different schools of facilitation or two different sort of entities, I think it's very difficult to get, um, to get that kind of like agreement and level of activity that Gary's talking about that is still under some umbrella of our competencies and ethics. And I think trying to get as many of those meetups as possible, even virtually is wonderful because we're, we're so spread here. Um, but I'm so jealous of what happens in India. You know, all my facilitation colleagues there in India, there's stuff happening everywhere. I, I just, I just want to go to them. There's, there's so much life and activity. And I think um, to pick up on, on Sunil's um, comment and hi Sunil, um, it's, I think it's a priority in areas where facilitation is more mature, like the States, like Canada, um, like, like here, they're mature markets. And one of the biggest things we face is people looking for interest groups that are highly specialized, like the graphics group or the dialogue group or the agile group. And um, I think it's urgent for us to keep doing as much as we can that is more of an umbrella that reminds us of what we're doing overall and getting those kind of meetup activities that I know Martin Gilbraith's always, you know, yep. I see him doing things. We're not doing it very well in my part of the world. I think it's a combination of a very, of a mature market and, and a competed market and very geographically dispersed. Yep. Um, so I'm jealous of people in India and China and parts of Europe where you've got such concentrations of facilitators in, in burgeoning growing markets for facilitation. So, so uh, let me add for the benefit of other facilitators and panelists here. Uh, so being from India and being very active in the IF India chapter, uh, we, we actually have now presence in six cities. And even if each city does an event a month, we have six events happening every every month. Um, uh, and that's interesting, you know, because when I do, I look at my work, there's one, one big challenge I am facing, and that's something which Tom is also talking about. Uh, the challenge is that the younger generation, so uh, we, we have certain people coming from certain generations, they are uh, they, they, they really want to deep dive and go inside the subject and, and they are uh, a pleasure for a facilitator. 
But if I look at the younger generation where uh, probably the devices that they carry are by itself big distractions, uh, they want a quick facilitation. It's like a pizza uh, here and now. Why are you taking so much time? You know, I, I understood what you want. This is what I'm contributing. Uh, so let's move ahead. Uh, what's the panelists uh, thought with, you know, looking at future, looking at the generation coming in and in future will come in and we'll have to be facilitating them. What, what are the things that we need to be mindful or aware of that we need to start building up now? Yeah, Hector. I would say um, give them the tools and get out of the way. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, no, the, sometimes, sometimes they, they, they have a grasp on what you're trying to do and they do it in a, in a collaborative fashion. And, <clears throat> and sometimes uh, we facilitators, we, we like our structure sometimes and, and we, we want to go through that and they could do it in a faster and, and leaner way. And, and, and sometimes uh, we just need to get out. I mean, also we need to, uh, the experience is critical and, and you cannot, uh, uh, go around that. In, it's like flying an airplane. Uh, you cannot learn flying an airplane only just uh, uh, in, in a couple of hours. You have to log several thousand hours in order to, to so they could actually put you in, in, in the front of a cop, cockpit. Uh, but we do need to make sure that that um, sometimes we need to ease that that like rain in. I would say that 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 energy. Um, because sometimes the group need 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 to go at a certain pace as well, so so uh, sometimes it's just um, make sure that the, the, those distractions that you uh, refer to are, are dealt with swiftly and promptly. Don't don't let the the cell phone discussion uh, start at the th minute thirty of your engagement, because if not uh, because if not it's it's going to be you're you're going to be fighting the cell phones for the rest of your engagement and going to be very useful. Yeah. Charlotte had uh, raised her hand. Uh, Charlotte? Yes. Um, you can hear me, right? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we can. Uh, I, f I agree so much with you, Hector. Give them the tools. Uh, but I don't uh, believe necessarily that we as seasoned facilitators should just get, get out of the way. We should give them the tools, then shut up and wait for them to come to us and start asking questions about, did you see what went wrong? Or how can I do this better next time? Um, because the thing is, facilitation to me is, is um, it's a craft. It's something you do. You cannot learn facilitation from your couch reading thick books. You, you'll get really smart by doing that, but you won't be a good facilitator in practice. So we need to go out there and start doing it and help, helping people learn from practice. And then we need to stay around and support them when they start doubting what they do and what they did and when they fail and when they fall the first times. We need to be there and catch them and, and you know, engage in the necessary conversations with them about what did you actually do? What worked, worked well? What didn't work well? How can you improve what you did this time, the next time you do it? What can you prepare for next time that avoids you to fall like you did this time? That's really been our core learning in the alternative on how to help newcomers begin. Because one thing is sure, there's absolutely no shortage of people that wants to facilitate. They, everybody, you know, they light up when they hear it. And when giving, when, and when they understand that in the alternative, they can basically come in from the street and start doing it. And somebody that, that is ready to engage a conversation with them afterwards will be there too. So, and, and, and that really entices people and makes them understand that this is a learning profession learning by doing so i need to we I think we need to stay around give them the tools the young people the tools and just stay around talk to them um i'd like to address also the urgent actions question uh, and i think that one thing we in the iaf should do every time we have an event 
being it physical or virtual like this, is that every event should finish with a 10 minute facilitated feedback session where participants are asked to give presenters or panelists or facilitators feedback on the event that they've taken part in. And I really miss that. We need to do that in a structured way and we need to do it. Sure. Um, thank you, Charlotte. That's, that's a very interesting point. Um, I don't know whether we'll be able to use that point within this uh, panel discussion because we had not factored it in. But it's a very, very interesting thought. And maybe Hector and uh, the team who's getting into panel discussions in future uh, need to look at how can we bring feedback um, back to the panelists or back to the facilitators, which is, which is so very crucial and important. Um, one thing that uh, really uh, comes uh, very very strong as a, a future is that future is bright uh, we we are we are on on a wonderful trajectory we are having a lot of facilitators but there's this uh, question in my mind uh, do we can't, do we really require external facilitators why can't facilitators be there uh, within that particular organization whether it's a non-profit whether it's a for business and why can't leaders themselves be facilitators? Uh, this, this connects to the point earlier we have discussed. So will in the future, we see more organizational managers or leaders actually using facilitation on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis for their meetings, for their various uh, discussions, conversations, and probably uh, they may not require, um, uh, you know, extra facilitators. What are, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you want to start with this? Okay, Bob wants to speak. Bob, go ahead. I, uh, I think that that uh, the, it's a real double-edged sword. I, I, I think that more managers than not think they already are good facilitators simply by the fact, by, by, by the, the, the shingle on their door, their name on the door. Uh, and I think that, uh, again, I'll go back to the point I made earlier. Um, yes, uh, managers can facilitate their own meetings, if, uh, but, but what we say to them is it's going to be the hardest thing you will do to be a good facilitator, which means being neutral, which means asking questions instead of telling people stuff. Uh, and those are the, those are two of the two of the things that that are the most difficult for a lot of managers to do uh, they they think they get paid to tell people things and uh, you know this is right back to basics this is back to core competency a good facilitator is neutral a good facilitator asks far more questions than they tell people anything and if we can um, reach managers to do those two simple things, uh, then we've done a huge service. Uh, we, uh, but the problem is getting those managers uh, in a class, in, in training that, 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 that helps them get those skills. Because in my experience, that's the big weakness. Managers think they have those skills, and most managers just don't. Yeah. True. Rhonda, you wanted to say something? Uh, yes, I just wanted to go back a little bit uh, to Hector's comment and Charlotte picking up about giving them the tools and, and getting out of the way. Um, one of the things I'm always concerned about is a tools driven approach to facilitation. Um, when people go and learn a stack of tools and then they think they're a good facilitator. And we see this all the time with sort of specialty areas of facilitation or somebody goes and gets a, a, a course where they learn to do a particular process. Um, and I, in fact, I wrote a blog about, about this a little while ago, before you go shopping for tools, read this. Um, and uh, because tools in the wrong hands can be very, very dangerous. 
um, you know, the Chainsaw Massacre is one example where somebody thinks they, they, they're going to be able to do something brilliant with a chainsaw and they do a lot of damage, not just to the group, but to themselves and people around them. So yes, Hector, absolutely give them the tools, but let's also um, look at not just the doing, but the being of facilitation. And um, it's how about how you show up. And it comes back to this ethics, but it also comes back to understanding the, the philosophical basis or the sort of theoretical basis of where we come from in that sort of engaged collaborative approach. That said, I've become a little bit wary of the word collaboration um, uh, because I think it's being overused and then I suddenly think back to the Second World War and the collaborators. And um, I, I do think in in this world that we're in now, we need to question the collaborators in some way. So I'm just picking up on, on that word. Um, but yeah, so much in all as I think people do need the tools and, and let them learn from that way. As Charlotte said, don't leave them alone just with the tools, but also the tools are the doing and it's a doing craft, but the, it's also the being. The doing's in the being, the being's in the yeah. doing. Um, and I think we need to make sure that there's some sort of understanding. For example, the underpinning need for trust. Um, you know, you've got a good tool, but you let loose with people in, incorrectly, you break down trust and you do damage. So, um, and, and many of us complain about misuse of dot voting, for example. That's a, a perfect yeah, example yeah. of a misuse of tool ending up with a very non-robust, valid decision um, with groups, with people not understanding the, the premise behind it. So yeah. that's all for me for the minute. Yeah, I, I see it in Asia that uh, we use the dot voting tool as a convergence tool and um, it's not really, really healthy, healthily converse. Uh, so thank you, Rhonda, for bringing that up. Uh, uh, I, I just want to change track a bit and uh, we, we have about 10 more minutes uh, uh, for our call to get close. I'll pick up something which Charlotte said earlier on. Uh, she did uh, put up in the first uh, uh, you know, conversation about the political environment and something that she shared was uh, spin doctors and facilitators. So she was talking about political environments requiring not spin doctors, but facilitators in future. Uh, I, I just wanted to look at this perspective now. Uh, if we are looking at future, uh, would would the political so we find that politics everywhere and especially I see in this part of the world it's it's very highly dominating. Uh, would um, what would be the role of facilitation and facilitators uh, in uh, uh, you know political space or when I say in ruling or engaging with other countries, Charlotte? Uh, because that was your point and. We'll yeah. start from there. Um, well, I've been reflecting on that question for the last four years, uh, where, you know, four years ago, I, I, you know, I saw a new political party being established in Denmark uh, with, without a political program, which in itself was pretty interesting, but with the promise to crowdsource its political program. And of course, you know, all the reporters, all the media were like laughing so hard, but I'm like, there's something there. So, so I decided to, to join basically because I was curious and thinking, what would it be like to facilitate politics? I mean, wh what would it feel like? Because I was used to working in a project organization and, you know, mm -hmm. which is very target driven. And, and one thing that, that, that is not in a political process is endings. There's lots and lots and lots of beginnings and very few endings because you know it's always a matter of, matter of negotiation. There's the, the political debate is constantly ongoing. So when is when 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 will we finish a political product? We don't. It's constantly being re reviewed. So so it's to me it 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 required a bit of a. a shift in mindset saying, okay, what if I focus less on what it is that we're trying to achieve and focusing more on, 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 on creating the most 
exquisite atmosphere in which to debate politics. So it was basically, to me, it was a shift in focus, very much in the group, very much on my own being, less on the doing, but basically doing my uppermost and best to interconnect people also, even, you know, things that I wouldn't have anything to do with after, but I could see them flowering because going off and doing whatever they wanted to do. Uh, and so it's, bas it's basically mind, it's a, it's a mind sh shift in, in my, it was a shift in my mindset from producing to, to um, making movement of, uh, in the people around me. Um, does it make sense? Yeah, you're not yeah. <laughs> kind of. Um, but I would, I would really like to reach out to the others. We come from different parts of the world. Uh, what, how, how do they see the role of the facilitator in future uh, when we look at political environments? Um, yeah, Bob, go ahead, please. I think you're on. Yeah, on I, I think we're back to, uh, to the issue of purpose. Uh, if your purpose is to uh, create a space for dialogue, then I, then I totally agree with Charlotte. Uh, I don't think that uh, that uh, but simply because we are framing this as politics that, that we lose sight of uh, as facilitators helping a group define purpose and deliverables. Uh, the deliverable may be who knows what, but, but I think that uh, uh, those, those two elements are critical anytime uh, we facilitate uh, uh, and, and helping the group uh, be, have, have gained clarity on the purpose of this discussion, the purpose of this, this session, and what do we expect to get out of it once we're done. Uh, I don't think that, that simply because it's politics uh, that, that that's not possible. I think that's very possible uh, in a political uh, framework. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. I'm done. Anyone else? Yeah. Hector, you want to put in, you, you know, it's, you are also in a very politically sensitive place. Yeah, and actually, uh, elections are uh, happening in this Sunday. Oh, okay. So uh, we've been. Uh, I I would say hmm, that it's badly needed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and it's also system. It it challenges the current system as well because a collaborative approach to politics. Also, that was the, all the idea in the beginning. Uh, in the, at the beginning, uh, at least in democracies, the idea was everybody has a say and everybody has a vote and everybody can contribute. Uh, our current democracies are, are not about contributing, but about getting votes and points, because basically that's points. It's a pointing system, it's, it's a match, basically. It's, it's a football match with uh, 120 million participants. And a so, so the thing is, I think facilitation can actually take it back to its roots of, 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 the, of uh, actual democracy there and, and, and actually engaging in, in meaningful conversations in actual argumentation and, 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 and consensus. Uh, however, uh, we need a very creative ways of doing it and, 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 and very engaging ways to uh, so, because I think it, 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 at the end of the day, the communities are the ones who have the solutions for the problems for the most part. So what I'm sensing, uh, Hector, is it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a journey by itself. Uh, we as facilitators need to really see how we can build value and, and be seen as strength rather than, you know, just as a profession. Um, but I think Rhonda wanted to say something. Rhonda, you... Just quickly, I would also like to hear from Gary um, as well on this one. I think as the IF, we need to be very wary of becoming connected with any particular or being seen to be connected with a particular political party. So we need to be apolitical if we're going to really influence. And one of the things I have seen here um, is there is a tendency 
for facilitators to be seen to be functioning of and from the left. And I think my own view, um, you know, that suits me just fine, but uh, to be honest, but my own view is we will never get the changes if we're only ever seen to be connected with one political area. And as I watch our parliament here on television, I just think, imagine what our countries would be like if instead of this adversarial debated situation, mm. the parliament ended up being a facilitated session just for one or two sessions of parliament. What, what would happen and how would decisions be made? Not even the full democracy like Hector's talking about, but um, just even our parliamentarians being facilitated by one of us for just one day. Um, so, and we will only ever get that kind of thinking if we are not connected or be seen to be connected of the left or of the right or of the Greens or, or whatever it is. So, I'm, uh, Gary, you've been quiet and I'm, I'm really interested in your perspective from the UK as well. We don't have anything going on here in the UK. We've only got EU exit to deal with, Christ Almighty. Um, so I, I think I think it's a great idea. Uh, ironically, here in the UK government, we have the Speaker of the House, which is meant to, which is meant to play a bit of that role. Um, and unfortunately, I have no doubt that the Speaker of the House is definitely not a trained uh, and certainly not a professional facilitator. Um, we we do have a, a, and I agree with you, Rhonda, about it, to, to try and and stay apolitical. But, you know, but we've done work both within the UK government, which is currently led by one party, and then uh, with um, focus groups and community groups, which, is be, which are being set up and led by other parts of, the, of other political parties. I think one of the things I think we see and we have to be careful with here is that um, we see communities being uh, involved in um, conversations around what, what should happen both politically and within their own communities and being facilitated by facilitators that are that are contracted by you know one or other political party and i think we have to be really careful around if we're going to involve communities there's a there's a thing around managing expectations in that yeah. yes you know we you know you, you're being asked to be part of a political conversation but but certainly don't expect to mean that that a that you'll be listened to and B, that anything you come up with <laughs> is, is going to get enacted upon, uh, because quite often it isn't. So I think we just have to be really careful. And, and we are beginning to see uh, us a very slow shift towards more involvement in, in regional and local communities in decision making, not least because, you know, putting it out on the web, the, the government in the UK has cut, has pushed a lot of, or cut a lot of funding, pushed a lot of stuff to local areas. So actually in your, you've probably got more of a chance of being listened to and facilitated in your local community to make an impact in your local community because they're not doing it from a central perspective. Interesting. Charlotte, your hand was up. So you want to yeah, add into this? And I'll keep it very short. Um, even though yeah. I fully agree with all of your panelists about the necessary neutrality and apolitical approach, I just need to say one thing also is, if you want to swim, you need to jump in the water. So, so whether it be within a party or an, uh, working a polit political, you need to get in there and start doing it. Wow, that's... That's, that's that's so jump in the water and just not be there as um, what we say as passerbys, be inside and walk the road. Um, so looking at time, uh, we have already spent about an hour and uh, fifteen minutes that we had scheduled for this uh, panel discussion. Um, as as a, a last thought, probably a very short statement, each one of us, so we can close. Um, what what is what is it that you would say is the future of facilitation? You said it in the beginning. I, I want it to be said now after this discussion. Where do you see it? Probably one word, two words, three words. Uh, how do you see it? So we'll start with uh, Bob. I think you are on, Bob. My my short version of this would be number one. Stick to the core competencies. Number two, 
stick to the core competencies. Number three, stick to the core competencies. Okay. Thank you for that uh, reinforcement three times. I thought it was the two other avatars speaking. Uh, and, we could, and, we could uh, probably throw in the code of ethics as well. I'll, 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 I'll revise my statement to that. Yeah. Okay. I don't care what you're doing, those things will get you through. Sure. Gary, what's your closing yeah. comment? Yeah. Uh, uh, so there's a couple of things for me. Um, facilitation is and should be a core competence. And I think there's been a lot of discussion on the chat around other roles that are doing facilitation. I think there's always gonna be a space for professional facilitators. And my last thing in terms of future facilitation is if there's not a local group, if there's not a local meetup where you are, start one. That could be you and one other person sitting in a coffee shop, having a chat about something, or it could be a meetup that's got 15, 20, 30 people in it. But so the future facilitation for me is seek out and support or create peer networks in your local region, even if it's in the same town with one other person. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. One, wonderful. I, I really love that uh, insight you gave. Rhonda? Um, I, I, I'm thinking of a child um, with huge growth potential, uh, a, a healthy child with tremendous potential to grow and, and still a lot to learn but is vulnerable to all um, external influences and going in different directions. And that's what I think the future of facilitation is. We've got a, a long way to grow. We're a strong, healthy child, but we're still vulnerable um, and we need to be protective of that. Is it a strong, healthy child or a stroppy teenager? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't want to ever go through having a teenager again. So. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for the imaginary. It, it really brought context to what you were saying. Uh, Charlotte? Well, in, in this time of age, digital age, with everybody debating in bubbles of uh, people that think the same as themselves, I think facilitators are more needed than ever. We need to, we need to uh, you know, we need to save the democracy. It, I mean, it's, it's very, very simple. And we need to do it physically. We need to bring, teach the young people how to facilitate. And yes, we need to hold on to our code of ethics and jump in the water and start swimming like mad. Okay. Yeah. And Hector, what's your last comment? Definitely. Uh, will facilitation is here to stay, I would say. Uh, we won't be replaced soon by technology, thankfully, but we could be replaced by ignorance or by that sense of, of oh, we already know that's there, but we do, we do need to ensure that uh, we go out and we talk about what we do. We, we, not, we don't only have to be uh, facilitators that are good with technology or good with techniques or methods and process and the code of ethics of the or the of the core competencies we also need to be evangelists of our profession we are all are ambassadors of our profession <coughs> and we need to train every single person even even if it's part of our families as well to teach them what do we do because sometimes even our families what do you do they ask and we need to be able to answer that and, and ensure that the value that we're providing to the communities that we serve is clearly understandable to everybody. Sure. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hector. So last bit that I can, I can close this with, um, uh, from, from this whole discussion. So I was privileged enough to be part of this discussion. Thank you all panelists. Um, thank you, Hector, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I, I see one word that, that is, that is is holding for me very strong and that's possibilities so i see that facilitation future of facilitation has a lot of possibilities from the conversation that we have had so i'm i'm personally going back with the word saying that okay you know future is bright as gary and others said 
so that's something to be uh, really thought about so for the uh, for the other people who are part of this call we had about 50 odd people joining in uh, we tried to take most of the questions on board but if the questions were very specific to uh, a specific need that you had and probably we couldn't bring it in to the panel discussion i'm extremely sorry and I apologize uh, but however you 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 can bring up certain things that you want to especially the ones on uh, what should if as a community and there was there was a suggestion for the board uh, you could give it uh, you could send this to the uh, hector and hector could take it forward uh, we couldn't take it up in this panel because we are looking at the future of facilitation more from a holistic perspective uh, so thank you all thank you for your time uh, we are in different time zones so i would end by saying good morning good afternoon good evening Good night. Uh, good see night, you. Good Bye. Night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good morning. Good Thank night. Uh, morning to you. <laughs> Bye. Oh, Ajit, Ajit, very quickly, can you save the chat? Can you save the chat? Uh, Hector, I'll, I'll save it. I'll save it. We can, we can save it uh, as uh, the whole discussion is in saved, and we're going to be able to post okay. it up and upload it at the side of the discussion on the IF website. Nice to meet you. See you. Wonderful. Thank see you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.